In this video, I'm going to explain about a rotary encoder and how it can be used in electronic circuits. I'll be using a Raspberry Pi Pico, but the encoder can be used with other microcontrollers, such as an Arduino, or you could use it with a Raspberry Pi computer. A quick look at what I'll be covering in this video. First, a quick introduction into what a rotary encoder is and when you'd want to use one. Then an explanation of how they work, including some waveforms and also some potential issues with certain encoders. I'll then show how this can be connected to a Raspberry Pi Pico, along with a quick guide to how to program the Pico to use the encoder using MicroPython libraries. So, first of all, what is a rotary encoder? It's a way of measuring rotary position or motion. In this example, it's going to be used as an alternative to a potentiometer to measure rotary motion or rotary position. When you look at the potentiometer and a rotary encoder, then they look very similar. They both have a rotary shaft and often the same number of pins, but the way they work and how they are used is very different. In an earlier video, I showed a potentiometer can be used to, for a voltage divider. The further the dial was turned, the higher the output. And this works well for some projects, but it does have some drawbacks. The first is that a potentiometer can usually only turn a set distance, typically 270 degrees although some can move several full rotations. But the other issue is when you use a potentiometer as one way of controlling the value, along with an alternative input, such as a web interface. The rotary encoder provides a way of knowing which direction the encoder is moving relative to its current position, which overcomes these limitations of the potentiometer. A typical example you have likely seen is a volume control on a modern car entertainment system. There is often a dial to control the volume but also buttons on the steering wheel so that the driver can control the volume without needing to take their hands off the wheel. If you used a potentiometer, then you'd not be able to use both these together, or at least you could end up with a situation where the potentiometer is set to a maximum volume, but the steering wheel has set it to minimum volume with no way of further increasing the volume using the dial. Using a rotary encoder, the value is relative. This needs a microcontroller or something similar to detect the direction that the encoder is moved and adjust the volume accordingly. Even if you change the volume using a different method, you can still turn the encoder and change the volume relative to what it's currently set at. I have two different types of rotary encoder shown here. The one on the left is an Alps encoder EC16B2410408. This is an older model and it didn't work with the Pico library. Newer encoders tend to be smaller in size such as the Alps EC12, E2430804, which does work. Don't worry about these codes, they'll all be in the description or on my website. Both of these models are without detents, meaning they have a smooth rotation. The one on the right hasn't got a brand name, but it was labelled as SKU026777. It does have detents. What that means is that you can feel a slight bump as it turns each notch. It also includes a switch, which is activated by pushing down on the top. It's got two separate pins for the switch, which are not shown because they're at the top and hidden by the rest of the encoder. There are other variants, including ones with built-in LEDs and some with more complicated encoding schemes, but these ones are fairly typical of ones you'll find. The encoders typically have three pins, a common signal, and then two others, which are referred to as signal A and B, or sometimes clock and data. Some encoders have built-in pull-up resistors, so they may have more pins, such as a five volt power pin. These standard rotary encoders, but then mounted on a small PCB. Essentially, they still work in the same way. I'll show you an example of a circuit later in the video, but first, let's have a look at how they actually work. So I'm going to use some waveform to demonstrate how the encoding works, typically based on a two-bit gray encoding, the one output being out of phase from the other. So here is the output in the clockwise direction, and it shows two signals. Signal A is leading, so it changes from a low to high signal before signal B. When the encoder moves in the anti-clockwise direction, or counterclockwise, 
then signal B is leading and that changes to a high signal before signal A. This can be seen more clearly if we look at the different directions alongside each other. Looking at the clockwise direction at the top, we've got signal A and then signal B. And then on the anti-clockwise, we've got the same signal A on the top and signal B on the bottom. This can be seen by looking at the upwards transition of signal A. If we look at the clockwise direction, when signal A first transitions upwards, then signal B is at a low value and the same on the second pulse. Whereas when going in the anti-clockwise direction, when signal A transitions to a high, then signal B is already at a high. By knowing which transition is happening, then the microcontroller can use this to determine the direction that the dial is being turned in. At least that is theory of how they should look like. And one of my encoders does look similar to that, as shown as by this display here. I've used pull-up resistors for this on the circuit, so the pulses go down to negative rather than up to positive, as I showed in the previous waveforms. So you'll see here we've got a yellow signal representing A and a green signal representing B. And they are overlapping here, but you can still be able to see that these have both got essentially the same pulse length but they're phase shifted. And this shows it being moved in the clockwise direction. So you can see the transition from a high to a low of signal A when signal B is low. When I looked at the larger ALPS encoder, ALPS encoder, again, we're looking in the clockwise direction, both signals are changing at the same time. But signal A in yellow is shorter than signal B. So the exact signal from different makes and models can differ. And whilst it's still possible to differentiate on the direction based on the order of the transitions, this did not work with the Pico library. So you need to have one that has got the same width pulses and that shifted out of phase, really. There's one more thing that we may need to consider, which is noise. Like all switches, when transitioning from one to another, there may be spikes of noise or switch bouncing, which can cause multiple signals. I've used this diagram here that shows a nice spike here. There's also a spike in the middle of the signal here. It looks like it perhaps didn't move on at that point. So you might need to clean these out to prevent these creating additional triggering. You could do that by adding external circuitry to filter out the noise. But the software library we'll use is based around a state machine and the way that that operates means that this noise will be ignored. So it's not necessary here that we have to actually do some separate debouncing. Here's an example of the circuit uh, connecting a rotary encoder to a Raspberry Pi Pico. The pins used are pin 14 for signal A and pin 15 for signal B. That's GPIO pins 14 and 15. And these will be referred to in the code as the clock and data pins. These could have been on any of the digital pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico. As you can see, these were conveniently positioned on the breadboard using the pins that are closest to the rotary encoder. I've not used any pull-up resistors on here, so they will need to be enabled within the Pico, which is just an entry in the code. But you could use pull-up resistors instead, which you'd need to connect to the 3.3 volt output of the Pico to give a positive output on the rotary encoder. So here's some very basic code to read the rotary encoder. First, you'll need to install the rotary encoder library module. I'll put the details for this on my web page. See the link in the description. Essentially, you just need to download couple of files and upload those onto your Pico. The library is imported with this line here and then after they've been imported it's just a case of creating an instance of the Rotary IRQ class. And then you can just read the values using the value method. There's several different parameters you can adjust when creating 
your instance of the rotary encoder. The important ones are the pins here. Let's say I used pin 14 and 15 on the Pico. Reverse depends on the direction, depends on the encoder, whether you're wanting it to go increase as you go left or right. And pull up equals true enables the pull-up resistors within the Pico because we're not using external pull-up resistors. Then there's just a very simple loop which reads the value. It stores it in the old value variable just so that we can do a direct comparison and only show when the value changes. Now that's something you can't necessarily do with a potentiometer and the reason being that potentiometer as a voltage divider gives an analog value and that may fluctuate slightly so if you did a direct comparison then quite often it will change in between samples whereas this is much more digital input and will only change value as you move the encoder. Uh, then as you turn the encoder the value shown here in the Thony console will change value as you move clockwise and then change negative as you move anti-clockwise. This is only a very simple example here but it's a good starting point for other projects so that you can imagine how you could use this to control values for any Pico project that you're wanting to do. So thanks for watching I hope you found this useful if so please give it a like. Please subscribe if you haven't already and I look forward to seeing you on my next video.